marathon. Nothing personal word of the day is mailbag marathon. We're doing mailbags for you. Well, um, I'm really not here right now. You are seeing a, it's what is it called? A hallucinogen, uh, coca. What's the thing where it's not really the person like Tupac does it sometimes? A hologram. Thank you, Coca. This is not me. I'm not here now. I have pre-recorded this and you are listening to it live as though I'm here, but I'm not. Mailbag. I like these episodes. You guys ask me questions within Apple reviews. Please go on Apple and review. Even if you have an Apple phone, just go to the Apple podcast thing. It's that purple app. It says podcasts, search nothing personal and hit subscribe and then hit unsubscribe and then hit subscribe and then go to where you can give it five stars and then write a review. Because for whatever reason, people associate the size of your, you know what, of your junk, according to how many ratings you have. And right now I'm a little tiny baby boy. And I want to be a man's man. <laughs> well, that's not how we were supposed to start the show. I can promise you that. <laughs> you know what Coco must think to himself? Why? Why me? Well, here's why, Coca. Because every two weeks, you get paid. Believe me, I have no illusions that there's another reason for it. So you come in and ask me questions within reviews on Apple. Sometimes you can do it on Twitter. I sent out a request for questions, got a bunch of them. I'm trying to answer a few of them here this week, next week, the week after, the week after that. There will be no more regular Nothing Personal episodes. Every single day from now till the end of time will be me answering your questions all day, every day I write the book. Chapter one. I love Elvis Costello. Nah, it's just while I'm away. Everyone stay calm. It'll go back to once a month. But your questions are really good, so we're going to start. It seems like the players slash owners have several issues they're willing to die for. In your opinion, what are the three to five biggest issues facing the two sides? Where is there an area for compromise? Everyone in baseball is very concerned. All the fans, the owners, players, everybody is slightly concerned about the possibility that there's going to be a work stoppage. That's the word you're going to hear throughout the coming months as the current collective bargaining agreement expires on December 1st, 2021. Right now, the union and the commissioner's office and his committee are doing the following things. There are members of the negotiating committee who work for the commissioner's office. Dan Hallam is the leader. You've got the commissioner, of course. You've got Chris Marinek, who works with Dan Hallam. But you also have certain owners who are on the negotiating committee. That means they are the owners who go to the negotiating sessions at the rectangular table at a conference room or on Zoom virtually. But those owners are also in charge of speaking to other owners, finding out where owners stand on certain issues. I used to think when I first got into the game that people cared what I had to say about different issues until I got smart enough to realize they didn't give one flying crap about what I cared. They were just figuring out whether I was going to vote on the side they wanted me to vote on. Once they heard from me that Jeffrey was going to vote a certain way, that's the last time we get a call on that issue. They did not care what we thought. They were solely focused on getting 23 votes. Bud Selig was more interested in 30 votes. Rob Manford is more concerned with getting 23 votes. And I made no bones about it as I got older in the game. I understood exactly when the owners would call last collective bargain agreement and I would have long discussions about it. I knew that I could keep them on the phone by saying, I'm not sure where we stand in terms of where we are voting overall in the agreement. I'm not sure where we stand in terms of supporting the commissioner on this new collective bargain agreement. I'm not sure where we stand, but what I do know is I'm trying to get a group of other small revenue, low revenue teams together, and I'm looking for eight, and you better be scared of me because if I get eight, you're screwed. What every owner tells the owners on the committee is I'm trying to get eight. If you get eight owners together, they've got a vote to block, Paul Lind. 
And that vote to block is significant because it stops an agreement. So what the commissioner does is he assigns owners to the negotiating committee, some from big markets, some from small markets. There's two, three, four, depending on the year. People who the commissioner knows he can work with well, people he knows who those owners can communicate with other owners. They assign different teams and owners to owners on the committee to talk to. They do it by who's friends with who, who can be influential over who in terms of figuring out where they are. The greatest trick we ever played was taking a call on a certain issue and pretending we were on one side of it. When it came to vote, we voted on the other side. Nope, never did that. That would be a great trick, but I would never do that because these people are our partners. It is our job to figure out a way to find peace. It is our way to figure out how not to have a work stoppage. It is our job to keep the game growing because that's the way we keep the value of our assets growing. And that is the job of the commissioner. If our assets grow, no matter what, let's pretend we lived in a universe where no matter what, every year, your asset grew by 10%. Every year you hold it for 50 years, it's going up 10% a year, 50 years. Do you know what the focus would be when it came to negotiating a new collective bargaining agreement? It would be solely based on year-to-year -year operational cash flow. If we had a guarantee that the value of our asset would go up, we would care only about whether we're losing money on a current day basis. If we're not losing, if we are losing money on a current day basis, and if we're going to lose 10 million in a particular year, our team better go up in value by more than 10 million. And we better have very cheap access to capital to pay that $10 million loss. If you tell us we can't borrow more money, and if we lose money, it has to be funded directly by the owner, owners will have a far different view of how much money they are willing or want to lose. If there's a flat curve, if rates are down, T-bill rates, 30-day treasuries are close to zero, let's say, and owners say, hey, you know, if I can even get a small increase in value on my asset, then I'm willing to put more money into it if you can show me a return for that investment. The problem is I always struggled with telling the owner, yeah, just get another shortstop sign one more pitcher, give an extra year to that guy, and the value of your asset will go up. I always said it, and I was right every single time, but it was based on calculations that I was doing in my head with one eye open. How do you guarantee that there'll be an idiot willing to go 1.2, right? You can't. So when it comes to this current collective bargaining agreement, the real thing that's happening is that there is some concern by owners that their ego is gonna get bruised. They've made so much progress over the past 15 years by winning these collective bargaining negotiations so significantly by giving the players fewer and fewer dollars as a percentage of their overall revenue, by having more teams trade hands at multiples of EBITDA that make no sense to any rational human being, by putting a value on teams that is based on nothing but ego of the person writing the check, idiocy of the person writing the check, desperation of the person writing the check. As long as you've got at all times more than one idiot around, team values will keep going up. How do you think the NBA feels when A-Rod bought into the Minnesota Timberwolves and claims he loves Minnesota? <laughs> Made me laugh. He likes Minnesota like I like olives. I don't. But the value of the team was high. The multiple was high. So Adam Silver was perfectly happy. But you want to know on a micro basis what big issues are happening. So I want to tell you. What are the three to five biggest issues facing the two sides? Ready? Number one. The draft and the international draft. Owners want an international draft. An international draft is where you've got a pool of players in the Dominican. You draft them in an order, much like the amateur draft. There will be slotting. Right now, the international draft, there is a pool. What a pool means is that you're given $5 million, let's say, to 
get international players. And you can give 4.999 to one person and then a dollar to one person or 10 cents to 10 people. You've got 5 million. You want to get extra slot money, you can buy it from other teams. But if you go over your total slot, you have a problem and you get punished. That's very good for owners, but owners want to take the next step now and they want an international draft with slots. And the reason is that it will make it far easier than to engage in what they're currently doing when they're showing off to you their great facilities in the Dominican Republic, when they're calling press conferences to announce they're building their own facilities and they're doing that to make it good for players, pretending that they care about teaching them English or cooking them good food or teaching them other life skills. Trust me, they don't. Trust me, teams can hire anyone they want in any position and call it whatever they want and do whatever PR videos they want. I know exactly, I've been there. This is our view of our international facilities. Find me a cheap player who can be an all-star. Find me a 16 year old because that is the cheapest way to acquire talent and let them be good. If I can lower the signing bonus to give to these kids, I want to lower it. Minimum salary is another big issue. I talked about it on the recent uh, pod, although it may be the next pod or the last pod, or there's five of them coming, or maybe four, maybe two, maybe six. I have no idea what Coke is going to do while I'm gone because I'm giving him the keys to the ship, of which, of course, he has a permanent copy anyway, so it's not like it matters. But the reality is that minimum salary is a huge issue for both owners and for players, and I don't understand why it's such a big issue for owners. If each team has 10 minimum players and the minimum salary is 500 grand and then it becomes a million, that means you're paying 500 grand extra to 10 players, right? That's an extra $5 million. So what owners say to the commissioner is, that's bringing our payroll up by $5 million. Horse hockey. If you know your payroll is gonna be $100 million and you have to allocate $5 million more to young players, guess what you're doing if you are smart? You're taking $5 million away from veterans or from the middle class or from the top of the free agent class. We are in control as owners. Presidents, we can decide what the payroll is and if the players union so badly wants higher minimum, give it to them and get something else. Who cares? And if I'm the players union, I want the minimum salary to go up because I want my younger players making more and the older players are not focused if they allow it because it's coming out of their pocket. But for whatever reason, older players look back to when they were younger and say, I want to leave this union in a better position it was than when I came up. When I was young, I was making 75 grand. Now look, you're making a million. That's what the players think. But if the minimum gets too high, the players will change their mind. There'll be an inflection point where they'll say, wait a minute, I listened to nothing personal. Where are the owners going to take this money from? You bet your bippy they're going to take it from you. So I think minimum salary is going to be a fascinating topic of conversation between the Players Association and the owners because both sides falsely think that it's an issue where they don't agree. Competitive balance is another major, major issue. That's something that you hear Tony Clark talking about all the time. I like that. We need better competitive balance. We can't have so many teams tanking. We got to figure out a way to penalize teams who are tanking, teams who are rebuilding. We can't stand a rebuild. Why? Because you're getting rid of highly expensive players and you are sending them to other teams, but they're still getting paid their high expensive numbers. But if the more teams tanking, they view that as bad for the game. Everybody who runs a team recognizes their windows of losing and windows of winning. For you to win, you have to recognize when you're in a window to win and then sign another guy. Stretch yourself a little thin, but don't be delusional. When you're on a position to not win, you be the Cubs and the Nats and you get rid of your players and screw them all if they call it a fire sale and start crying in their shoes on Twitter, or on the radio, or on YouTube. They don't know what they're talking about. You do, you're the executive. 
And the players union says we can't have it. We can't have 10 teams who aren't in it when the season starts. Fair enough. Find me one sport right now, please. I'll wait. Let me take a break. I'm going to right now have a sip of water. Here I go. Mm. That's some tasty water. That reminded me of Samuel Jackson in Pulp Fiction. That's a tasty, what was it, a big kahuna burger or something, Coke? I can't remember. All right, I give up. Where was I? What was I doing before we were taking a break? Can you imagine? Did that really just happen? That's what happens on a random Tuesday, Coca. I think we were talking about, oh, find me a sport. Coca's not paying attention. Why would he be? Find me a sport where the first game of the season, every team has a chance to be in the playoffs or to win the league or to win the division or to win a World Series. Find it to me. Find me that sport. Can you? Did you find it yet? Is it hockey? No. Basketball? No. Football? No. College football? Definitely not. College basketball? No. Nah, maybe someone could win a tournament in an upset if you make it to the top 64. Maybe you make an upset in the conference tournament to get to the top 64. Baseball? Forget about it. MLS? Doubtful. Although Inter-Miami, I think, is one win away from making the postseason in MLS. I think they're one messy away from winning. There are always teams that are competing and teams that are not competing. And the impact is what? It's de minimis. Are you annoyed as a fan when your team's going to lose a hundo? Yeah. Are you excited when your team's going to win a hundo? Yeah. Are you disappointed when the team that's supposed to win a hundo doesn't win a hundo? Do you call for the scalp of your manager? Your general manager, your president? Do you call for extension a manager of the year? Manager of the year is meant for someone who takes a team that's supposed to be bad and is great or good and takes a team that's good, supposed to be good and is great. It's all about expectations, right? We always would want lower expectations. We like our team this year. We think we're going to be competitive. We like our chances. We don't believe we have any holes, but if we do, we'll fill them. We like our chances of playing October baseball. The union has had a burr up their behind over this competitive balance, over tanking, and we love it as team executives. Keep focusing on that. You're going to do great. You're going to get a lot of gives in collective bargaining when you're focused on competitive balance, I promise. Okay. Arbitration. That's a very serious issue, Coca. Arbitration is a system where when a player has more than three and fewer than six years of experience, the player can ask the team to pay him a certain amount. The team can ask a player to accept a certain amount. And when they disagree, both sides can ask three arbitrators to tell them what to pay the player and to tell the player what the team will pay. That's called arbitration. That's when you go from making half a million dollars to three and a half million dollars overnight or 8 million or 12 million or 16 million. But the thing about arbitration that I used to love is that players get paid for what they've done, not for what they may do. Payers get paid in comparison to other players who have done similar things in similar situations, not for what you're being sold as a bill of goods by the player agent. You don't realize what a guy you have here, David. This guy's a 4120 guy. Look at his ops, OPS. Look at his slugging. Oi, did you see that defense? You need that. You need balance in your lineup. You better sign this guy's a lefty. You need balance. What are you going to do? 27 times you lost the lead in the eighth inning. My guy is your eighth inning guy. Together, you are going to make it. Looks like we made it. The Players Association wants arbitration at a younger age. They want players making more money. You can solve arbitration by paying younger players higher by increasing the minimum. I'd be more than happy to bring players to arbitration every single year. I'll put a player in arbitration after one year of service. One year, done. Happy to do it. I'm happy to do arbitration the minute a player starts. It would tax the system, wouldn't it? Now we get more arbitrators. When you are running a sports team, Pay people for what they're going to do, not as a thank you for what they've done. 
Take a look at the number of contracts that don't work when you pay players a thank you contract, a pillow contract. I don't want you to leave, so I'm going to sign you again. I appreciate everything you've meant to this organization. You are just the World Series MVP. Here's $245 million over seven years, Stephen. We love you here in D.C. Oh, my God, I know you don't pitch much. But, geez, do you think you'll start like 10 more games the rest of your contract? Free agency every year, I'm in. Sorry to hear about your loss. Thank you. That's a, that's a whole thing. It's been, it's been a stretch, folks. I, I want to say on this show, and I, I've said it on other shows that we've recorded, I think. I've heard from so many of you on Twitter and on Instagram and anywhere else. Thank you. I don't wish anyone to ever lose a sibling young. It is, uh, it's not good. Question, what are three wait to sees in the next Major League Baseball collective bargaining agreements? Ooh, Coca, should we do it? All right, Coca, you're gonna have to pay attention here. You're gonna have to take a few notes. You think you can do that? Can you, please? Hello, hello. Cocalicious. All right, he's not here. All right, someone else is going to have to remember these for me. But I'm going to give you some wait to sees. I'm going to give you three. You asked for three. I'll give you three wait to sees. And we're going to keep track of these as we go back and look when the collective bargaining agreement is rewritten or re ratified. Here we go. Ready? The minimum salary it's going to be greater than $1 million. That is a huge victory for the players. <laughs> no, it's not. They're going to say it is, though. In the press release, when they talk about the new collective bargaining agreement, the owners are going to point out what a big give that was. The union is going to tell you what an unbelievable victory it was to achieve that increase in the minimum salary. And you and I, listening to this show, Together, we are going to laugh. Wait to see the minimum will be greater than or equal to 1.0 million dollars. Two. Oh, I'm going to have to explain this, aren't I, Coca? Although, Coca, I might as well be talking to myself here. Coca, are you, you're not in my ear, and I know you should be because you always are. And I don't understand what's bothering you. I understand that we're doing shows when you don't normally do shows. I get it. I understand you're tired of the purple jacket, which people can see on the Nothing Personal with David Sampson YouTube channel. I get it. But it doesn't mean you can leave me. Did you have to go to the bathroom? Are you sick? If you are, I'm sorry. I thought your COVID's feeling better. Isn't it? You told me it was. I'm not going to talk to you anymore. I'm going to do another wait to see. And you're going to have to re-listen to the show when you post it. And you're going to have to write it down because I'm not doing it. Number two. I'm going to have to explain what a super two is. I talked about arbitration on a recent show. It may have been the last mailbag episode where I explained that arbitration is when a player has more than three and fewer than six years of service. However, service is a year of being in the big leagues or at the big league uh, injured list. There is something called a super two. A super two, as you would imagine, is someone with two years of service, but not yet three. Greater than two, fewer than three. There are a certain number of players, normally in the top 10% of all players between two and three years of service, who get arb eligible for arbitration. Do you remember when I tell you on a show, they're not going to call this guy up until the middle of June. And when you call someone up in the middle of June, you do that so they are not eligible for arbitration as a super two. When you call someone up in April, the first week of April or the second week of April, like Seattle did with Kelnick. Those players are eligible for Super 2, but they're under control of the team for an extra year, which is why they're not called up to start the season. So every decision made by a team is all about service time manipulation. And service time manipulation is a very big deal, and the players union can't stand it. The players union feels as though the best 25 guys should be on the roster at all times. And that's because the players union doesn't understand how to run a team. 
I would love to tell you that we put the best 25 guys on the team at one point, but we don't because we have to take into account roster decisions. There are rules of when a player needs to be on the 40 man roster and the 40 man roster consists of players from whom you choose 26 of those players to be on your big league roster on a game by game basis. So 14 of your 40 man roster plays in the minor leagues. 26 of your 40 man roster plays in the big leagues. After a certain number of years in the minor leagues, players have to be put on the 40 man roster or they have to be subject to being picked in a rule five draft, which is a rule that says you can take a player off another team's system if that player is not on the other team's 40 man roster. So each year you have to make a decision. So look at the transaction pages after a season ends of your favorite team, and you'll see player X taken off the roster, player Y taken off the roster. That's normally free agents to be or mediocre players who you're not going to bring back. And then you'll see a bunch of guys you've never heard of added to the roster. That's to protect them. So they can't get chosen by another team. Super two is something that we avoided all the time when we could. By the way, we always could, but there were examples when we did not avoid it and it was purposeful, but the majority of time we'd avoid it. Wait to see. Right now, Super 2 has a calculation that's semi-complicated in terms of where you are in terms of days of service between two years and three years. Wait to see. The eligibility of players for arbitration is going to be larger. There will be more players eligible for arbitration as a quote Super 2. They will change the days required of major league service to be eligible for arbitration and they will decrease them. That's the way to see. All of that is complicated. Let me break it down. Let me break it down into little tiny atoms. There'll be more players eligible for arbitration after the collective bargain agreement has ratified them before. Third way to see. This may be an existing way to see. There will be universal DH. I promise you. Fourth way to see, we're doing a bonus one. I don't know why I'm talking to Coca. Coca is A W O triple L. Fourth way to see is about international games, the World Baseball Classic. I was watching Japan beat the US two to nothing. Japan got the goal. Congratulations. There was no Ichiro on the team, no Shohei, no major leaguers of any kind on the team. That'll not, not gonna, that will not happen. Olympics baseball is gone in 2024. I read that, Coke. It can't be true. I read that it's been replaced by, uh, uh, I, I want to say hay riding, but I think it could be breakdancing. Is it possible that breakdancing is a sport in the Olympics? Or could it be roller derby? Could it be co-ed naked twister? Maybe it's Jenga. I can't remember but I think the baseball will not be in the Olympics in 2024. There will be an agreement between the players and the owners as it relates to international play, to the World Baseball Classic, which is Major League Baseball's Olympics, World Cup, and the All-Star Game. Because what happened this year in Denver will never happen again. Never say never. I don't believe that what happened in Denver will happen again, where so many players said, you know what? I want to be with the family. I don't want to go. I'm good. There's a rule on the books right now that says if you are named to the All-Star Game, you have to come unless you are granted permission, unless there are extenuating circumstances and wanting to be with your family is not an extenuating circumstance. Wanting to save yourself for the second half of the season is not an extenuating circumstance. Wanting to make sure that you don't aggravate an injury for which you are not in the injured list is not an extenuating circumstance. They're going to tighten that up. You're going to see new rules in collective bargaining regarding the All-Star game. We don't want to fight with players about going to play internationally in London or Japan or South America or Africa or Asia or Canada. We want players to just play where the games are. Help us help you. Help us make more money so we can give you less. Help us get better TV deals so our teams can be worth more and we can give you less. Don't give me a hard time about doing things that you don't want to do when we're flying you first class in sleeper seats with very, very nice 
food. We're going to make it a rule that if you don't do that, we're going to fine you $500. <laughs> That's the joke of these rules, right? The collective bargaining agreement says that we've got the right to fine you up to $500 if you do not do the following. Now, it's not an 81 game suspension like for steroids. It's not part of domestic violence policy. They're separately negotiated with the players union outside of the confines of an agreement that are then worked into a collective bargaining agreement. When you negotiate them in between agreements or while a current agreement is in effect. It was always impossible for us to discipline our players or make them do something they didn't want to do because the fines we were able to levy were so ridiculous. They weren't even enough to reserve a room at the Rosebud. So while the rules are going to come, and that's my way to see, there will be rules on the All-Star Game and on international play and on the World Baseball Classic. Wait to see. There will be. Coca just told me, are you serious that I got it right that it is breakdancing? I thought I was reading The Onion. There's no way breakdancing is replacing baseball. There's no way that the commissioner's office got involved in making sure that would happen so the World Baseball Classic would be the only form of international play. There's no way that baseball is satisfied with not being in the Olympics because owners don't want major league players or even their better minor league players going in the middle of the season or going to play in the Olympics. No way that's the case. Can't be. No chance, toilet pants. <laughs> Thank you. Another question. My condolences to you and your family and the loss of your sister. Thank you. You mentioned MLB wanting to get to 32 teams. What other city beside Las Vegas would be in the market to have a team? The reason I wanted to put this question in is while I have addressed this from time to time, what interests me is the amazing obsession that people have who live in cities without professional sports, who want professional sports, are the same people who don't want any public financing of stadiums. They don't want to see tax breaks or incentives or rich people getting richer but they want something they don't have and they don't realize that in order to have what they want, they're gonna to have to do things that they never thought they would do and certainly don't wanna do, but at the end of the day, they'll swallow hard and do them. And the reason they'll do them is they want professional sports. And do you think we don't know that? Do you think that Rob Manford doesn't know what he's talking about when he says that Las Vegas is a viable option for the Oakland A's? And for people who think I'm bluffing, they're in for a sore surprise. Do you actually think for one single second that the commissioner doesn't know what he's doing? Do you know why he doesn't say the same thing right now about Nashville or Montreal or northern New Jersey or Hartford, Connecticut or San Antonio, Texas? Or going to Memphis, 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 Tennessee. I'm going to Eagle River. Eagle River could have a professional sports team. Green Bay, Rhinelander. You never know. Coming to a city near you as a professional sports team. What other city is in the market? What city isn't in the market? Find me a city that says we are a minor league city. All cities would want a professional sports team. They just don't have the tax basis to do it. They don't either have the tourism the tourist taxes, or the willingness of local people who live there to fund what needs to be funded to get that team. Do you remember in the paper when Jeff Bezos, the richest man in the world, was negotiating with different cities of where to put Amazon facilities and was talking about all the jobs it'll bring and all the excitement and they would get pitches. Teams would, cities would go. They'd get the celebrities from cities sports stars and actors and musicians and other people to do a video to Jeff and say, we want you here. Government officials fly overseas to talk about the benefits of their community, their city, their town, their village, their district. They go talk to other companies, other chambers of commerce, trying to attract business all the time. They want people living in their cities because that increases the tax base and that increases the services to the people already living in those communities. They want entertainment options for the people in their cities because it's not just good for the people in the cities, but it helps attract new people to the cities. That's what the bidding is for. 
Portland, Montreal, Nashville, Sacramento, Memphis. They're all candidates, San Antonio. You know who will get it first? It's based on realignment. It's based on what happens in Tampa and Oakland. And it's based on time zone. When you look at the makeup of the Major League Baseball, Tampa Bay Rays cannot relocate to the West Coast. It would make it unbalanced. They can't be in the AL East playing in Seattle or Portland. The Oakland A's can't be in the AL West playing in Montreal. So that's why Rob said the Oakland A's are moving to Vegas. And that's why Stu Sternberg says we're moving to Montreal. Do you think it's a coincidence that they're all moving in north-south direction? Be better than that. You know the difference. Hi, David. Hi. How you doing? How you doing? How you doing? I thought that was always Rocky or Sylvester Stallone, but then I watched the Friends reunion, and maybe it's Joey from Friends. How you doing? Then I thought it could have been the Fonzie. Hey. Did Fonzie ever say, hey? Oh, no, he may have said what's happening. Oh, no, maybe those are the people from what's happening. Hey, what you talking about, Willis? No, that's different strokes. Hold on, I'll get to it. Norm. No, that's not it either. Hi, David. Hello. What is the formula for a lower revenue team to gather enough talent to compete for championships when arbitration and then free agency comes so quickly and draft picks are so far away? How do you create the window? This is one of my favorite questions. It's one of the most interesting questions that you could ask, actually, in my mind. So you've heard me talk about what some people refer to as large market and small market teams, right? Large market teams, LA, New York, Boston, Chicago, small market teams would be Minnesota, Kansas City, Cleveland, Tampa, Miami. Oakland's not a small market. Miami's not a small market. I refer to them as high revenue and low revenue. The Marlins, the Indians, the Royals, the Rays are low revenue teams. The Red Sox, the Yankees, the Dodgers, the Cubs are high revenue teams. High revenue teams, the biggest difference is they can make more mistakes than we can in player personnel. Have you ever, you know the expression in the, in the real world, have you ever heard this? People do this all the time when they see rich people getting richer. They just say, hey, the rich get richer. It's way easier to make your second million than your first million. Once you're worth 50 million, it's easier to get to 100. The basic concept of that is rich get richer. Takes money to make money. That's another good one. I always like that. Second only to, you tell me, like everybody else tells me that I need experience. How can I get experience if everyone says you need experience? I have to believe the chicken came before the egg because then how would there be more chickens? But of course, you can't have a chicken if you don't have an egg. And how do you get an egg if you don't have two chickens doing it? It's one of the great mysteries of all time. I guess it could come from a McRib. It's very troubling to me to not know the answer to that question. I think about it quite often, actually. And the question that you asked, I think about too. How do you open your window? Do you know that we plan our windows years and years in advance? In my briefcase, I would carry around our payrolls one year, three year, five year, pay attention to the service time of each player, estimate what each player is going to get paid each particular year, create a roster every single day, look at it, change it, think about it each year, Think about next year's roster this year. Think about two years from now this year. Maneuver this year's roster. Make trades this year that you know will impact next year and the year after. That is all about creating and maintaining your window and getting it right is the hard part. You asked a question that I'm going to change. You asked about how to create a window. You don't create windows. You recognize windows. The executives will tell you, oh, no, we created this. 
I, Pat Riley does that all the time. He actually invented it. And he and I've actually laughed about that. Yes, I've been planning this for 40 years. It's exactly as we thought it would happen. We started creating space for this player three years ago. And by golly, we got him. We did it. We knew LeBron was going to bring his talent to South Beach. We didn't know. We hoped. So therefore, we made the room. Brian Cashman says, I need your international signing bonus money because we're creating room for Shohei Otani. Uh-oh, he's an angel. Brian Cashman knew that Otani wasn't signing with the Yankees. We all knew Otani was signing with the West Coast team. You don't create money and openings three years down the line in baseball. They're called blank spaces. FA1 is what we call them. Free agent one, you'd put in the fourth starter slot because the document I carry around had slots. Pitchers, one, two, three, four, five, SP. Then six through 13 is RP. And then you do by position, 1B, 2B, 3B, SS, LF, CF, RF. Yes, those are the positions on the baseball field. I forgot C because they're not on the field, but that is still a position. So we're calculating it. We're looking at the money. Then we're looking at where our revenue is. We're looking at where we think our revenue is going to be. And then we are projecting a payroll. When we project a payroll, we then decide, are there any extenuating circumstances that will lead to an extra special influx of money? Is it possible that MLB will sell part of ML BAM to Disney and distribute an extra $50 million in year three? Is it possible that you're going to sell 15% of your team, Mr. Owner, and have an extra $100 million, $200 million, $500 million that you want to put into the team over a course of 10 years? Is it likely that we're going to have a debt payment that we have to make in two years time where our payroll is going to have to go down, not up? Is it true and likely that your depreciation and amortization is going to expire in one year? Therefore, our payroll will be this size and not that size. We are looking at all of those things, deciding on payrolls, knowing what we think could happen. And when there is surprise upside, that's called trade deadline acquisition. That's called sign a free agent in March who's still available because you've got extra money to spend. When there's downside surprise, you know what that's called? That's called get rid of your players as quickly as possible to lower your payroll. You may call it a fire sale. I call it a Tuesday. One of the greatest things we've ever done as executives is make believe we're smarter than all of you by telling you all these things that we do that frankly, we don't do at all. Oh, I'm an Ivy Leaguer. I'm a Badger, actually. I love the Badgers. Go Badges. By the way, the Badgers, I just found out, are favored to win the college football playoff this year. And they are favored to win the men's basketball tournament. That is so cool. I, When I was at Wisconsin, they never did that both at once. I believe this is supposed to be the year. So congratulations in advance to the Badgers for winning the CFB, PF, A, Chang, and also the uh, CBS Tournament of Champions in March. <sighs> We're not that smart. We say that we create windows. Do you know how many mistakes every executive makes? We say that we do jobs that you can't do because we're too scared of thinking that you could do the job and then we're not so special and then we're not going to get paid all the money that we get paid. That's all it is. We pretend we have this crazy talent. It's not like we're pilots. It's not like we're curing cancer. We're not doctors. We're not setting people free. Playing fantasy baseball. You would not believe who's calling right now. Someone whose name I just mentioned. It's very bizarre. I'm not going to take the call, though, Coca. I could take the call, actually, couldn't I? I'm going to take the call very quickly. I'm on a call. I'm actually recording the show. I'm going to call you right back, okay? Thank you. Former president of baseball. I've talked about him on the show. His name is Robert Dupay. Calls me from time to time. Anyway, I want to finish today's mailbag by just telling you that the reason why we perpetuate misinformation about what we do as being so unique and special is because it makes us feel better and feel more important and enables us to get more money from our owners. We have all these special codes that we have, special ways that we can communicate. All we are is good. If you're a good GM, it means you're good at running a business. That's it. Other people think they're GMs because they play fantasy baseball. Fan playing fantasy baseball is what the GMs do when they're doing trades. 
the real differentiating factor that we do that some people are not as good at, but could be if given the chance is running the business the business of baseball, the business of figuring out how to get the most from people while paying them the least, the business of having hundreds of people report to you, of managing huge business centers, revenue centers, expense centers. That is something that is difficult to do. The running the business, the communicating with people above you and below you, of thinking about things in a non-emotional way in a business that is so super charged with emotion. Dealing with public issues, dealing with being in public when some people cannot. Those are some differentiating factors, not knowing for sure when we're going to have a window, when we're not going to have a window, which player is going to be great, which player is not going to be great. The Tampa Bay Rays have a smart front office because they're all smart guys running a great business and they let emotion have zero to do with it. Zero. That's what makes them great. People say they're the example of creating the window. They know how to create a window better than anybody. No. Say it better. They know how to recognize the window better than anybody. Recognizing something is way harder than creating it. Answering the door to opportunity is way harder than hearing the knock. Taking advantage of getting your foot in the door is way harder than having your foot in the door. Daring to be different is way harder than just believing that ordinary is okay. That's our show. We're going to do this again because that's what we do.